If you write articles or copy, or even work as an editor for a magazine, you're going to want to listen to this advert. Are you looking to save time writing online content? Well, Phosphor AI is an online service that will save you hours of work with your content creation. All you have to do is type in your title, and their AI software will get to work writing a high-quality original article just for you. You'll need to review the article and take 15 to 20 minutes to make necessary edits, but then the piece will be ready for publishing. Just for signing up, you'll get three free articles so you can try out Phosphor AI and see what it can do all for yourself. Why waste time writing online content yourself when you can get Phosphor AI to do it for you? Try out their service today and see just how much time you can save. That's Phosphor AI. Go to phosphorai.com. Let's get going. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I'm here with Dr. Anthony G. J., the author of Estro Generation. Um, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, not a problem, man. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before we started, uh, I've been looking for someone to have yeah, a discussion about like chemicals in our, our yeah, food, water, uh, the testosterone sort of discussion, um, or, like the issue of phthalates like lo loads of these things have like sort of come across my radar but i've not had anyone like who actually knows what they're talking about to speak to about it sure so yeah sure. hopefully you can help clear uh clear some things up for me today um, oh yeah i'm sure <laughs> yeah so Happy to help. brilliant so um then yeah why don't we just start at the at the beginning with like yeah the basis for your book like what are what are estrogenics like what, what are these things yeah man so when I was doing my PhD, I did a PhD uh, at Boston University Medical School on the topic of cholesterol and sex hormones. And the connection between those, by the way, is that sex hormones like estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, they're made from cholesterol, right? And as I was researching that, that whole world, I came across artificial estrogens, like these chemicals that act like estrogen in our bodies. Um, and there are, they're unnatural, right? Like they're, there's, they're, they're made from petroleum generally, but there's some that are found in nature, like soy makes an, a, a chemical that acts like estrogen. So certain plants can make estrogens. And so estrogenics is just a term that basically means something that acts like estrogen in your body could be natural estrogen, could be plant chemicals that are tricking your body into thinking there's more estrogen. It most often is petroleum based artificial chemicals found in fragrances or birth control or just plastics. So that's kind of estrogenics, something that acts like estrogen. Okay. So like just how prevalent are these in mm. our like food supply and like just in our day to day lives? Super prevalent. Yeah, man. So I made a top 10 list in my book and the, you know, Agent Orange, the chemical that's super toxic, you know, they use it in warfare. That screws with your hormones, but we're not exposed to that every day. So what I focused on in my book are chemicals that we're exposed to every single day. And that's a top 10 list. I mean, that gives you an idea of how bad these things are because, you know, there's 10 of them. And for example, you know, atrazine is one of them. Atrazine is a chemical herbicide they spray on grains. It's actually in America, it's the second most commonly used herbicide and it acts like estrogen. Well known, well established, you know, it screws with your hormones. It lowers your testosterone. Um, so it's, it, it goes beyond the plastics, although the plastics are a huge component of this. There's a lot of different chemicals they use when they're making plastics that leach into water and leach into oil and leach into liquids that act like estrogen. Um, so yeah, there's a lot. And the problem is too, if it was just one of these chemicals, you could do a toxicity study and say, look, here's the dose that's safe and that's it, right? And that's a hard study to do because it might take 10 years, right? Because breast cancer or something like that, like breast cancer is up 250% since 1980. Massive increase wow. in breast cancer. 250%. Yeah, and it takes a long time to develop breast cancer, right? It's not like an overnight thing that you can pick up in a six week scientific study. Yeah. So so that's 250 percent like, oh yeah it's exploded so that's like what well, that's like 20 no it two and a half times as many women are getting mm -hmm. breast cancer exactly. what like annually wow yeah in some countries it's 500 percent 
like the Philippines and some of these countries where they have more industrial creations of plastics that they're shipping over to the U S and, um, it's just jumped exponentially. Uh, and are those and, numbers population adjusted? Like, like, do they account mm -hmm. for population growth? For a hundred thousand. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Right. And by the way, the population hasn't jumped to 250%. So even if it wasn't population adjusted, yeah, it's no. not like we've doubled in population in America or whatever. Uh, and like, is it, is it, is it anything to do with the, like the age of the population possibly? Uh, it could be a little bit. Yeah. Probably contributing a little bit, but mm. No, I but mean, not that significantly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's true of depression and other stuff too. There's a lot of things that are on the rise that, you know, maybe there's some age contribution. Maybe there's just more awareness, right. And all this kind of stuff, but you either have breast cancer or you don't like, it's not necessarily an awareness thing. It's pretty obvious when you have it. Mm -hmm. um, but especially when you're in a third world country and you're getting it right, because then it gets really grotesque and, you know, and it develops a lot further along than it should. And so, but the point is, you know, if, if you were studying one single chemical and you had a long enough period, you could make a pretty good idea of what the toxicity is and whether or not we should have any of it or a little bit exposure. But the problem is when you have 10 chemicals, right? Um, you, nobody's doing a study with 10 chemicals and they're saying, well, this is one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one eventually equals 10. And these are all acting like estrogen. So they're actually all compounding the problem. And that's a huge problem in, in our, the way our research is set up because we do toxicity studies. We do them on a very short time scale, but at least we do them, but nobody's doing them in multi, multiplicity. Then nobody's adding additional chemicals to those toxicity studies, even though it's probably a logical thing to do. Hmm. Okay. So then I'm sure, yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely other examples I've heard you cite, but uh, just, just of the things that we've spoken about and, and like the, the rise in, in cancers, depressions, um, lots of things like this, like what is the connection between these like estrogen mimicking chemicals and, and the, the rises in in those things like what's the connection there what's that doing to the body that you think it means that that's the the cause yeah it's tricking the body so breast cells especially in women are very hormone sensitive right so if you disrupt that delicate balance then suddenly you've got cells that are growing way too fast and growth is misregulated and out of control boom it's cancer uh depression is harder to to figure out right like a good example of depression with hormone disruption is postpartum depression women have a baby their hormones get all screwed up and they get depression you bring in a bunch of plastic chemicals a bunch of atrazine from herbicides a bunch of fragrance chemicals made from petroleum all acting like estrogen boom you end up with depression even children by the way uh they've done studies where they look at people's urine of BPA, for example, and phthalates. Mm -hmm. And the more of that stuff is in their urine, the more depression they have in children, which shouldn't even be getting depression, like little kids, you know, like age nine, uh, I think was the average age in that study in the BPA study. So it's disrupting the brain because the hormones are impacting our brain, right? Like, especially testosterone is another good example because with exposures to these chemicals, testosterone lowers and that lower sex drive, you know, it lowers the way people, it changes the way people think. Even in animal studies, if you lower their testosterone by giving them a bunch of these chemicals, uh, they don't pursue the female rat as much or whatever species you're interested in. It changes. It's called sexual apathy. Like they just don't care. And so you see that in our culture, right? Or it causes gender dysphoria, right? Like they're, you, you get like a confused uh gender physically you see it physically like it changes the gonads it changes sexual organs and you see it at a mental level in the brain because it's changing the way your brain is working and again the brain is tricky to study but it's definitely you can see it in reality when you do these studies and i think you see it in the culture too so anytime you could you know like anytime you can think about pregnancy it's probably a good model for hormone changes like for women when they get pregnant their estrogen goes way up, right? So they start at like 200 and then it goes to 2000. And when that happens, uh, you get a lot of weight gain, right? Like the body stores more fat. Women will tell you this because our ancestors didn't always have access to food for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So it's actually an adaptation to store more fat 
for pregnant women because fat is a real efficient storage form for energy. It's good for energy storage. And if they didn't have food, then the fetus can still have uh, calories and things because there's a lot of fat there. And what happens if you put a bunch of atrazine into somebody or a bunch of phthalates or BPA? We get fat, like we gain a bunch of fat weight, right? Our body thinks we're pregnant, even if we're <laughs> men or women or whatever, it doesn't matter. You're basically imitating that process in a screwed up way, right? Mm -hmm. In a dysfunctional way or perverted way. So you can see a lot of reflections in, na in nature that are just perverse with these artificial chemicals, the depression, the low testosterone, the infertility. Of course, it disrupts your fertility, right? Like you're altering your sex hormones. That's one of the main functions of sex hormones is to monitor and regulate fertility cycles and fertility in general. So um, I know I threw a lot of stuff at you there, but that's kind of the big picture. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I was just thinking, it's amazing how these like tiny, like microscopic chemicals can, can theoretically be at the source of so many like large, like, like, you know, global problems in a, in a oh, sense. Oh yeah. It's, well, they're in nanogram levels, right? Like in your blood, you've got, like I said, like women have 200 nanograms per deciliter of estrogen. Men have about 20 usually. I mean, that's nanograms. That's 10 to the minus ninth grams. It's 0. 0.000000001 grams. <laughs> that's pretty damn low. <laughs> oh, that is, that is definitely low. Um, <laughs> Wow. And yeah, yeah such, such tiny adjustments in these like tiny chemicals that can be like yeah. so, so disruptive, like. Exactly. <sighs> and they go through your skin too. That's the other thing that's a little tricky with these. A lot of people think like, oh, my skin is protecting me from this sunscreen that has these chemicals. Sunscreen, by the way, is notorious for having some of these artificial estrogen chemicals. They've even made it illegal in a lot of countries because uh, it's killing off coral reefs and stuff like this. Like there's a lot of marine species that are becoming infertile, just like humans wow. from exposures to these chemicals. But it's a more, it's such a fragile environment that you lose one species. And then that species that was pre predating on that species goes out. And then that, you know what I mean? Like there's a food chain that gets that, that you can wipe out really quickly if you just wipe out a couple species. So, uh, you know, the skin absorbs these chemicals and even smelling soaps like soaps that have a lot of fragrances you put those on your skin people think they're washing it off and they're washing off the soap portion of it but the fragrance portion prefers to stay on your skin your skin is oily you know if you think of like eating chicken skin or something skin is fatty right and fats that's that fragrancy stuff is like oily fatty stuff and remember sex hormones testosterone estrogen progesterone they're made from cholesterol right mm -hmm. So cholesterol is like butter. It's like it floats on water. It's real fatty stuff. And these chemicals are real fatty. So they like to stay in your skin. They don't want to go down the sink and they don't want to wash out the drain. They want to stay in your skin. So you put them on your skin. You think you're washing them off. You're not. So the fragrances are a big one. And like when it gets down to a practical level of how do you avoid these things, you got to really pay attention. There's some fragrances that are good, right? Like there's natural fragrances and, and there's flowers and there's fruits and things that have a lot of natural fragrances but for the most part these companies and these corporations that make soaps and uh armpit detergents like you know uh deodorant or excuse me deodorant i didn't mean detergent but i mean detergent for laundries all this stuff right like fragrance 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 every every aspect of our lives those are for the most part cheap petroleum-based chemicals that act like estrogen people should get rid of them you know, it doesn't have to be like, you got to go throw it out right now, but slowly phase them out as you get new stuff hmm. and filter your drinking water. I mean, drinking water is another massive source of artificial estrogen chemicals. Like what percentage of the products on a supermarket shelf would you say contain these hmm. chemicals? Just like wow. ball, like just, I don't know. It doesn't even have to be ballpark. Just roughly, do you think? Yeah, I would say it's like 75% plus, you know, somewhere in that range. Uh, anything that's liquid and plastic, it's almost a guarantee you're going to have artificial estrogen chemicals in that product. Okay. And, you know, like I'm thinking of salad dressings and I'm thinking of juices and sodas and even bottled water, all that stuff, you know, they've done studies. And again, what they oftentimes do is they say, oh, it's, it's in there, they, it leaches, right? Everybody admits that, but they say, oh, it's safe. It's within the normal safety limits and all this. But they're forgetting 
number one, it bioaccumulates, it builds up in your body. So if you have a little bit and then tomorrow you have a little bit and then the next day you have a little bit, it starts to build up in your fat cells. So that's the first problem. And then number two, you're adding in like other sources from other foods. So the, yeah, the bottled water is adding a little bit, but then you have some salad dressing and that's adding a little bit. And then you have some soup and that's adding a little bit or whatever, right? Like you have these freezer things you're heating up in plastics and then you're adding more and on and on. And then you throw the sunscreen on or the whatever the thing, the soap in your shower and you're way over the safety limit, way over. In fact, the sunscreen, they did a chem they did a study after I published my book. Unfortunately it was after, but um, they, they took regular sunscreen. It's got a chemical called oxybenzone. Um, and after I published my book, there's been a lot more awareness of this chemical, thankfully, but it used to be every sunscreen, like literally everything. Now there's alternatives that are pretty good and stuff. So, but they, they did one application of sunscreen, Josh, just one application. Seven days later, people's blood levels of oxybenzone were still above the government safety limits. Whoa. One yeah, application. And that was a week it. later. Fuck me. A week later, yeah, just from one application. And that's just that one thing, right? Again. People are doing way more than that with other chemicals they're, they're adding on top of that. So, and that's the government safety limits. The government safety limits are bullshit. You know, they're not very safe. Like yeah. I think, because again, <laughs> it's, it's additive. They're not doing the long-term studies when they finally do break out and do a long-term study, they find it's way worse than they thought. Um, that particular mm. chemical, the former chair of the FDA in America said, he basically said like, this is insane. We have to do more research. We've got to be super cautious about this. And it's like, yeah, that chemical has been legal for 30 years and they finally did the study. And now they're finally saying it's insane. Like you basically have to watch out for yourself these days with these chemicals, because you can't really trust the government to watch out for you. There's too much money involved in politics, especially in America. Mm. And there's, and there, you know, these companies are very influential. They're very persuasive. And the studies are very tricky because again, they're not doing them right to begin with. They're not doing long-term studies. They're not doing additive studies with multiple chemicals on and on and on. So why, why is this not something that is being widely discussed as a major issue? Because like, it takes, why, why it are takes... you, yeah, why are you the first person that I've come across? Like I, I'd never oh. heard of the word estrogenics until I mm. saw your book. That's the first time I ever heard that term. Yeah, it, it, it's it's getting out there. Like BPA, right? You've heard of BPA. And you see the water bottles that say BPA free and things like that. Like BPA was one of the first ones that started to raise awareness for this. Um, and so that one's the most studied. You know, there's like literally over 50,000 research studies on that chemical BPA, bisphenol A. And they're super negative. Like it's bad. As you go through those studies, it's like, oh shit, we're screwed. Right. And you know, what's funny about it is the BPA free products, what these companies have done is they say, oh, look, it's BPA free. It doesn't have BPA and BPA stands for bisphenol A. And what they've done is they made bisphenol S and they call it's called BPS. It's just as bad for you. And they <laughs> use it instead of BPA, but the studies haven't caught up to that one yet. So they, you know, they can use that and kind of get away with it. But, um, but people know about BPA, like that one's been out there. And then now people are waking up to the phthalates, right? Like when I published my book, nobody was talking about phthalates. Mm. It's spelled P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S, super weird spelling, super weird word, hard to remember. But now you got Shauna Swan on Joe Rogan's mm. podcast talking about just the phthalates and talking about how bad they are, right? She's even talking about feminization and anogenital distance and mm. how people's, you know, uh, sex organs are changing and how problematic just that one chemical see the thing is is i took a bigger picture look at it in which nobody's done and and i said look let's take the phthalates let's take the bpa but let's also add the soy and let's add all these because there's some of them that are politically incorrect like, like people don't want to admit that soy is bad because there's billions of dollars with soy products and <laughs> processed food in that whole industry and the vegans are like super emotionally attached to soy for some reason it's like you can be a vegan without freaking soy but for some reason a lot of those food companies that are vegan, they promote soy and they've got soy in them and they've got all these sponsors and they hate it. Like they, I've been invited on vegan podcasts. And then when they find out I'm, I'm against soy, they like remove the invite. They've like pulled the, 
pulled the invite and said, oh, sorry, <laughs> we've invited you. We're going to like rescind the invite because you're not a fan of soy. And we have sponsors and you know what I mean? It's it's <laughs> it's hard to take a big picture approach and not be biased with this stuff. But I don't you know, I, I don't make money with soy products and I don't have sponsors and things like that. So I can kind of say whatever I actually think. And if people disagree with me, that's OK. But at least I'm going to say what I think. Well, it's so funny that they just decided to uninvite you because of sponsors. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> oh, I can't believe oh, yeah. that. I mean, I can't actually well, believe it if I'm totally honest. Yeah. But um, what? Yeah. Uh, the 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 impossible meat and the like beyond meat stuff is that like does that have any of these chemicals in it? Oh sure. I mean, um. You know, it, all scientists agree that soy has isoflavones and isoflavones act like estrogen. Like that's just a part of soy, right? The plant soy and the isoflavones like for the plant, like, you know, you have hormones. Everybody has like dogs have hormones. Cows have hormones. Plants have hormones. And some for the most part, they don't act. They don't screw up your hormones. But soy has one that acts like estrogen. It's, it looks like estrogen. It acts like estrogen in your body. And all scientists agree with that. Like nobody's debating that notion. Mm -hmm. The thing that they debate with soy is they try and tell you that it's good for you. They say, oh, you need more estrogen. The estrogen in soy is good for you. It helps to protect against whatever. And that's a little bit of a slippery slope. Like it's dicey. You know, you can make those arguments and you can look at studies that show that. But you can also find studies that show the opposite of that. So it's hit or miss with the research on this one. And that's because, in my opinion, there's two reasons. Number one, we're super saturated with estrogen, right? We've got phthalates. We've got BPA in our bodies. We've got like all these plastic chemicals, all these fragrance chemicals. And then you throw a little bit of soy in there in a research study for a couple of weeks. Yeah, you're probably not going to notice any difference. <laughs> um, so we're super saturated with the chemicals. So we're, the, it's all this noise. You can't get above the noise with all these chemicals. That's the first problem with soy research. The second problem is that soy, it acts there, our estrogen receptors, we have two receptors that pick it up. Like when it's flowing, flowing around your bloodstream, it gets picked up by alpha and beta receptors. It's called estrogen receptor, alpha estrogen receptor, beta. And it's a little technical to get into, but the alpha receptor is the bad one. Like that one increases breast cancer. It increases prostate cancer in men on and on. There's a lot of problems and it's not really supposed to be turned on. It's like a light switch. You're not supposed to turn on that light switch, except when you're sexually developing right? In the womb. And then after that, for as an adult, you're not really supposed to be turning on that light switch. And the beta receptor, the estrogen receptor beta, the other one that grabs out estrogen out of your bloodstream, that's a good one. Like that's protective against breast cancer and that's protective against prostate cancer. So people that promote soy, they like to say it's turning on that light switch. It's turning on the good light switch, the beta receptor. Not the bad one, the alpha. But unfortunately, the research shows that it flips on both receptors, like both light switches get turned on, the bad one and the good one. And some people that's okay. And it's kind of offsets each other. It's a little bit of yin yang. Some people that's bad. In my opinion, it's too risky because we have enough estrogen as it is in our culture. We're pretty saturated, but I'm open to debating it, but I don't think it's a good thing. Mm. What do you think the reason is for their like ideological or uh, seemingly at least ideological cling to soy. Like what's behind oh, that? It's money. It's always money. <laughs> I mean, it's the <laughs> same reason when you go to the doctor, they want you to lower your cholesterol, right? Like it's always about selling prescription drugs. It's always about some kind of monetary incentive, you know? I mean, literally 20% of adults in America are on Prozac, Zoloft or Lexpro, like anti depression drugs uh, that are called SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Serotonin, 95% of our serotonin is made in the gut. If you just eat healthy, you don't need those drugs, right? But do they, but they try and muddle it up and muddy it up and say, oh, we don't, you know, eat, eat lots of whole grains. You know what I mean? Like they make it all messy and confusing and try and, you know, tell people that you just need to count calories and that's eating healthy or you need to eat lots of grains. And honestly, that's the opposite of good advice for most people. And so there's a lot of confusion in the diet world, which leads to a lot of prescription drug sales. There's a lot of confusion in the heart disease world that leads to a lot of prescription drug sales. And the same thing is true in the 
in the food industry, you know, like the pharmaceutical in industry, they used to be super influential with these doctors. They're a little bit less because the laws have changed and they don't let you bribe the doctors anymore and things like this. Oh, like the, the farm, they used to bribe the doctors. My dad's a, a medical doctor. <laughs> it's it's um, political correctness gone mad. They should be able to bribe them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they used to for sure. And, and then the doctors <laughs> would really push these prescription drugs. Um, and there's a little bit less of that, but the doctors still push the prescription drugs. So it all works out in the end for these companies. But like the vaccines, I mean, look at how much these doctors are pushing and pushing and pushing, right? But it's a product, you know what I mean? It's sales. But the, the food companies, they're still allowed to really push and bribe and like coerce and and they do, man, like they work on these dietitians at these universities. They really try and get there and tell them, look, it's all about calorie counting. You know what I mean? Like they want to promote carbs because carbs are particularly addictive. They act on the cocaine center of our brain. When you eat carbs, you get hungry two hours later. So then you want more food. And then two hours later, you want more food. So there's certain patterns that you see in these giant food companies. And one of them is more processed food they want to do more processing right more processed food because then it's more shelf stable longer lasting they can put more shenanigans in there that's more that makes it more addictive you have they hire scientists like me to design these foods to make them more addictive not to make them healthier to make them more addictive right it's all about money and the soy goes into that category i'm just thinking about the plastic fucking cup i'm drinking from <laughs> and the plastic tea mug i fucking have this is awful yeah, yeah. everybody I, yeah or at least have my water bottle that's not plastic i got a, i got glass one how good for you yeah, yeah that's man. that's my that's my that's my that's my you know weapon in the fight against this um, but like how much how much is it really possible to avoid these chemicals like day to day it's surprisingly possible. Again, I've done it. Like my personal care products are super, super clean on my website. By the way, I have like a little summary list of like, here's the soap I use. Here's the shampoo I use. Here's this, here's that. And at least it gives people ideas. Like they don't have to buy the exact brand. I don't even, like I said, I don't have sponsors. I don't have any of these companies that I make money on, but I can just tell people like, Hey, here's what I use personally in my life. And, and, uh, and I've cleaned these chemicals out. And the Tupperware is one thing, you know, like I, I, yeah, you see the AJ consulting company.com. Uh, it looks like you're going to that page, right? Yeah. That's what I'm looking for right now. Um, yeah. Right on. And if you, I'm if you go pulling, to the, pulling what I use people page, here. yeah, perfect. It's called what I use. Yeah, um, I got and it's pretty extensive. It's almost too extensive, but I figure it's built up over the years, you know? I figure I'd rather have too much information than not enough on there. Because people ask me these questions. They say, what, you know, what shower curtains do you use? <laughs> Stuff like that. Because there's actually, ironically, there's a study on shower curtains. And it shows that as you heat water and that, that hot water is splashing up against the plastic curtains, it dissipates more of these estrogens into the air. And then you're breathing in more of these estrogens. So it sounds crazy, but in reality, it's a, it's a thing, you know? So, yeah, you got it's the over and everything. Down curtains mm. what is <laughs> oh yeah sunscreen yeah lotion i even put some sun shirts and stuff on there mm. just like i say just a lot of clothes too oh that would make sense fucking yeah oh yeah there's a lot of clothing made out of plastics i never wear polyester underwear you know like cotton underwear um i'm okay with polyester to some degree but i don't like to wear it as a base layer because it's polyethylene the word polyester stands for polyethylene terra phthalate it's full of phthalates it's made from phthalates um yeah glass blender right yeah. and even soda like the problem with aluminum cans they line them with plastic they're not technically aluminum they're actually plastic bottles oh you're just... gonna you're gonna ruin my coffee pods for me now oh man <laughs> don't do this yeah yeah just that's like my, that's like my one joy in life i was hoping you were gonna let me cling on to there for a second <laughs> What can you, you mean going to the coffee shop and having coffee or what? No, you like my little, like my uh, Nespresso pods for my coffee machine. Oh yeah. Cause well, can't you get like the aluminum. biodegradable ones? They make biodegradable ones now. Oh, the biodegradable, plastic. right. So, the, so, okay. Then if it's a biodegradable plastic, does it not have these chemicals in it? Well, they don't use plastic. They'll make it out of like legit paper. So it disintegrates a little bit more, and, okay. but it's, it's at least not full of plastic chemicals. Yeah. Okay. So the they biodegradable have, have ones. 
Yeah, they're good. The they're, green ones. They're yeah. not gonna kill me. Or at least Correct. they're not, they're not gonna kill me. Yeah, they're not gonna yeah, <laughs> slowly kill me. That's good. Okay, right. I will look out for biodegradable ones. Okay. Well they make metal ones too, like with those pods, you can buy metal uh pods that you just put the coffee yourself oh in there man have you tried doing that like i i <laughs> my flatmate <laughs> got me them and it's every day it's a mess just trying Enough, to scoop yeah. scoop the coffee into the thing and then like tamp yeah. it down while trying not to spill the coffee anywhere and you know what coffee's yeah. like it just gets everywhere yeah True. <laughs> yeah man well i'll tell you what i do there too i do i like i always do something right in my own life i do cold press coffee i don't let I don't like cold coffee, but I make it, I grind a pound of beans and I put it in this big glass jar overnight. And then I filter out the grinds. You can put it in these like hemp socks. So you don't have to filter out the grinds, you just pull out the sock. But the point is it's, it's room temperature. It says cold press, but it's room temperature. And then I, I, I take that coffee and it's real concentrated. I put it in the fridge and every day I just pour some in a cup cut it with water a little bit because it's so concentrated put it in the microwave for a minute and a half boom i've got my hot coffee it tastes amazing i roast my own beans i have a coffee bean roaster right behind me here and i'm like a super snob about this but i don't really do you're a super much. snob and you this is this is acceptable to you okay oh yeah it tastes better man i'm telling you if you uh make cold press coffee and you heat it up you'd be surprised how unique it tastes it has like a more floral taste and it's not quite as much caffeine, which I like. I don't need loads of caffeine all the time. So then I can have more of it without getting over buzzed. And I don't know, like there's always an alternative solution, right? Like you can do pour overs with ceramic and glass, like uh, those Chemex machines. Mm. You know, it's like a glass thing that has this, the top is bent out. So you yeah, can yeah. put a filter in it, Chemex. It's called C-H-E-M-E-X. Yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we got yeah, we got a bit sidetracked there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, what you're trying to say is, if you really want that, you can find ways around most things. Correct. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's never going to be perfect, like you're saying, man. Like it's okay. It's okay to have some uh, guilty pleasures, right? <laughs> you're going to have some stuff that you cheat on, that and that's okay as long as you've gotten rid of all the other shit, right? So it, the more strict you are with the fragrances and the personal care and whatever else, then you can get away with a lot more in other areas. Because again, we're all going to be exposed to plastics. There's no question. So the, the idea is, well, how can we minimize it and hit the big ones? And it's the 80-20 principle, you know? Hmm. Yeah. So I think for, for people listening to this who maybe haven't heard of your work before or you know haven't explored this topic, we haven't really hit like the like the, okay so we have talked about the higher cancer levels and mental health problems but i don't think we've like truly like nailed down like this the amount of problems that are being caused by these chemicals in our food supply or water supply and stuff so like if you had to give like the the top three like problems that that, that these are causing or maybe even top five of, of things we haven't mentioned that that like that would be enough of a reason for someone listening to this to go, okay, it is worth that effort to go and find these like products that do not have that in them. Yeah. Lower testosterone would be one of the big ones, right? I think for men, men hate to have lower testosterone. <laughs> and if they, at least they should hate that. Like if it makes an impact, it lowers your energy. Nobody wants low energy. And, uh, and for women, the big one is weight gain. Like women hate to get fat and they hate to gain weight and they hate to struggle with weight loss, you know? And, and so those are the two biggest ones I think that are the most impactful just to motivate people mm -hmm. because it's noticeable. If you get all these chemicals out of your system, you know, give it six weeks, get rid of your personal care products, get rid of the plastic and you remeasure your testosterone. I've seen people double their testosterone in six weeks. You know, they go from 300 to 600, just boom. And I've done podcasts with people that are like, I'm going to see what, if this is right. And like, I'm going to do that experiment and they've done it and they've been amazed. And, and it's brought a lot of like, you know, book sales because people are like, well, I want to find out about that because it actually works. And so, and that's just six weeks, you know, obviously you're not going to go from 600 to 1200 in your testosterone. If you're already kind of high in your testosterone, <laughs> you're not going to double your testosterone, but it's, it's amazing, man. In the 1980s, the average male was 500 on their testosterone. In the 90s, they were 400. In the 2000s, they were 300. It's just gone down and down and down. And what they've done in the medical 
community in the medical profession is they've lowered the normal range for testosterone to expand and to, to accommodate those people. So they tell you that 300 is normal. If you go in and you get 300 in your testosterone, they'll tell you it's fine. They won't give you any treatment. They won't give you any help. Any They won't give you advice, nothing. They just say, oh, you're fine, you know? And even little girls are going into puberty at younger and younger ages, like age nine and stuff. And they're trying to lower the normal range for puberty now. Instead of making it 12, they're trying to make it nine because it's so common that girls are going in too early. And that's causing its own set of health problems later in life for these people. But, you know, I would focus on the testosterone and the weight gain because those are noticeable. A lot of people hit weight loss plateaus like they they lose weight pretty easily initially when they're trying to lose weight, if they're like really obese, but then they hit a plateau and it's really hard and they're doing everything the same and their body won't do it. Estrogen, you got to get your hormones in, in line. You know, these estrogen chemicals, get them out of your system. Use a sauna. It accelerates the process, but at least avoid them. Don't keep putting them back in. <laughs> That's interesting. I want to come back to that actually. So then um, what I was going to ask uh, what would be like, what is, Aside from like like people hear testosterone and they go, Oh yeah, right. It's like the, the chemical that makes you like fucking manly or like I don't know, wanna like, fight and sure. fuck things. Like <laughs> that's the most like <laughs> urban dictionary description yeah. of, of it, right? <laughs> oh yeah, did you well, did you see James Cameron just like last week, the the movie producer of Avatar and stuff? <laughs> yes. Yeah. He said it was toxic for men or something. <laughs> I can't remember the exact quote, but he basically said like well, let me see if I can pull it up. Avatar director James Cameron says testosterone is a toxin. Men must terminate from their system. That's what he said. <laughs> oh, so, that's amazing. Like you, yeah. that shows you the sort of confidence that money will give you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, a lot of success in his life as well, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. He's made a few big movies, hasn't he? Uh, <laughs> Not a not yeah, not someone to go to for, uh, health advice. You know, yeah, health advice. <laughs> Apparently not. No. no. Well, yeah, I mean, I I can't tell you how many clients I've had because I do DNA consulting too, right? Like I look at people's genetics and I help them uh, prevent heart disease and prevent Alzheimer's and all this stuff. Like the goal is prevention. You want to find out which genes are problematic and fix them. You know, like honestly, change your diet so you can fix that stuff. And I have a lot of clients when I'm doing consulting that uh, number one have optimized their testosterone, right? That's a huge one. And, and sometimes you can't, like sometimes you're so far gone with the hormones, your hormones are just shut, shut off and you can't resuscitate them. You get on TRT, you get on testosterone replacement therapy. And those people that do that, they always say the same thing, totally transform my life. Tell all your clients to do this. Like it's amazing. And it's like, well, some people don't need to, but when I, when I have people that are super low and they can't get it back up naturally, I do tell all my people to get on that because it's so life changing. All of a sudden they go from just dragging their feet, just barely getting through work. And they're just sitting on the couch after work, watching Netflix because they're too tired and exhausted to do anything. Suddenly they're like tons of energy, super motivated out doing stuff, going back to the gym that they've never done. And that opens up more doors for health, right? Because now they're exercising it and then they're tired. So they're sleeping better at night and on and on. And just like snowballs into this crazy journey of health optimization. And it all started with just that one hormone. And it's that important. It's mm. not just about, you know, growing muscle or whatever. It's yeah. way more than that. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I think people underestimate the extent to which it's really important for just, yeah. A stable and, and healthy life really um and, and yeah. yeah and you don't want to overdo it right like obviously you don't want to overdose it either it, it can be problematic if you're super super high dose obviously but to say it's toxic in general it's just rid ridiculous um oh, yeah so um what you mentioned about about changing genes there um like do like do you is it in your opinion possible to change like your yeah your your actual genetics through like i don't know lifestyle and diet no you can't change the genes so what whatever genes you have that's like your blueprint that's you're stuck with those genes for the rest of your life mm -hmm. but what you can change is the risk so like let's say for example right it, it requires an example let's say you you've got super high risk of breast cancer right and we know that 
BPA, phthalates, atrazine, all the stuff we're talking about increases the risk of breast cancer. So because you have those genes, number one, that means your ancestors probably weren't exposed to these chemicals for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So you probably shouldn't be either. And you should be more vigilant about not exposing yourself to these chemicals. And then, yeah, you're not, your risk goes way down. You probably will never get breast cancer. Stop worrying about it. Another good example is heart disease, right? I had a client this morning I was talking to from, uh, from, uh, 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 Florida. And I had two clients. One was from Germany this morning. One was from Florida. It's pretty fun, right? I get to talk to people all around the country, all around the world, but this Floridian, this person from Florida, they had a rare gene that not super rare actually, but like 5% of people have this gene. Um, and it's not a risk of heart disease or heart attacks unless your ferritin is high. If your ferritin, which is another way of saying your iron in your blood, if your ferritin is high, your iron, your blood iron, it's a tenfold higher risk of heart disease, Whoa. super high risk. Whoa. So the obvious thing is make sure to check your ferritin on a blood test because you don't want that to be high. And if it's high, there's very well-known strategies for getting it down. It's not like rocket science, but most people are never checking. Like when's the last time you checked your ferritin? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> probably never, right? It's not on your radar. No. Um, and most people it's not, and it shouldn't be because it's not that common of a gene, but maybe you've got some of these rare genes. Some people do. Like, of course, if you, we have, 25,000 genes. And so it's pretty likely you're going to have a couple of defective ones that aren't super good. And you can do things about it because like I said, if you went to the doctor and you had a heart attack, they would blame your cholesterol. Like they wouldn't even check your ferritin, even if you had this gene, because it's not something that they think about in this regard. They don't think about preventing heart attacks. They just focus on cholesterol. That's all they're trained to focus on. Again, that's because that's where the drugs are and that's where the money is. But, um, it could be a ton of different things that are actually at the root cause of people's heart attacks. And ideally you don't wait until people have a damn heart attack to begin with. You just prevent the heart attacks with this sort of strategy, right? You find those genes you... and it all comes from our ancestors, right? Like our ancestors for thousands, thousands of years, they weren't exposed to this. They weren't doing that. They weren't doing like, they weren't waking up and drinking orange juice, right? Maybe your genes are awesome for doing that, but maybe, a lot of people aren't because their ancestors didn't do it for thousands of years. You see, so most of the time it's just identifying the genes that are not compatible with our modern society and just moving away from those few things that you're doing that are in the modern society that it will protect your health, mm. you know? So obviously I'm assuming that this is a specialist service that, you, that you're offering, but like, yeah. Right I, yeah. Um, but how, how do you ever foresee a world in which this is like standard practice for everyone to be, um, you know, testing and trying to understand? I think it should be. I don't know if it ever will be simply because of the corruption mm -hmm. aspect of it. Because if you prevent heart disease, then they lose a lot of money on their stents and their thousands of like $50,000 surgeries that they would have gotten money from. You know, I have a doctor friend, he's a surgeon. He does knee surgeries, right? He's an orthopedic surgeon. And, uh, this is crazy, but it illustrates what what it's like out there, and in, in, at least in American medicine. Now, he, he every day his job is do knee replacements. You go into the hospital, you freaking change somebody's knee, you put a new knee in there, mm -hmm. and it's like a crazy. He's making like millions of dollars a year, you know these guys. And he started telling people, let's let's just yeah, you need a knee replacement, but let's do one month with zero carbs. Super simple, like not super complicated, just like cut carbs from your life for one month. You can do anything for one month, just mm -hmm. cut carbs for one month, one month, excuse me. And then let's see if you need a knee replacement. And like so many of these people no longer needed a knee replacement. The hospital put him on a leave of absence for two months or for two years. <laughs> they put him on, he had to get lawyers and they, they literally basically fired him without firing him. They put him on a leave what? because he was just helping so many people. Because, <laughs> because he was telling them don't something that was working it was working yeah because a lot of the knee joint pain that people have is related to high blood sugar so instead of over complicating and saying like let's count your calories and let's find out how many carbs you're eating and like let's get super normal, just said just cut carbs anybody can do that for a month right unless they have diabetes or something you have to be a little more careful and even with diabetes you can do it you just have to be more cautious and slowly ease into it and whatever but the point is the hospital set up to make money they were losing shit tons of money and of course, that's the same thing with the genetics. Like if you start preventing disease before it happens, 
Well, now they're they're losing their Prozac and their Zoloft and their Lexapro prescriptions. They're losing their statin money that they're banking on, you know, all these billions of dollars. So I don't know if it'll ever become commonplace in the modern conventional system because the system is set up to make money and this is a money losing proposition for them. But it but it might become commonplace just because it's so good for people. Yeah. That's it. I don't know. Depends if we ever get, you know, AI doctor. <laughs> yeah, AI is hopefully gonna come along and help people with this too, because number one, it's probably a lot more accurate, you know, and it can synthesize a lot more of the research because just on the topic of breast cancer, there's literally like 10 publications per day. So I like I gave a talk on cancer one time in Baltimore, Maryland. I was invited to give a, a talk on cancer and I'm not a cancer expert at all. So I went up there on the stage and there's a lot of people, a thousand people. And I said, uh, look, I'm not a cancer expert, but I don't think anybody's a cancer expert because even if you're just focused on breast cancer, that's your only specialty, not all cancer, but just breast cancer. There's literally 12 publications per day on that topic. Nobody's reading 12 research studies per day. I don't care how like obsessed you are with a certain topic. That's too much information. You can't synthesize all that information that's just flooding in from all around the world, with India doing research and Europe doing research and the UK and America and obviously China and all these countries, Japan, flooding in like research just pouring in. And that's just one example. So you need artificial intelligence to, to kind of like piece that all together and pick out the stuff that's really uh, priorities and and yeah, the genetics are a huge component of that, right? You have to customize this information. And it's hard because, you know, to set up a system like that, there's always that initial, you know, like the initial cost and the initial hesitation, and there's going to be mistakes. It's kind of like self-driving cars. It's clearly would be better, I think, but there's always going to be skepticism and nervousness around the whole thing. Yeah. Is... Is this like a, you know how you talked about, you know, all the studies like pouring out constantly and is, is this happening in like all areas of medicine? It's like the, the entire, or is the entire medical or even maybe scientific community like missing loads of stuff? Do, oh, yeah. do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, is there loads, is there, yeah. is there loads of knowledge out there that's just not known? Does, does that, yeah, because does that it's make... getting drowned yeah. in the noise. Yeah. Partly, but also it depends where the money is. Like cancer research is super well funded because of all the charities and all the politics and everybody's aware of it. Whereas, like, you know, I don't know, there's some other areas in, in research that people get totally ignored, like thyroid dysfunction, where you have just have low energy because your thyroid hormones are screwed up. Nobody cares. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's hardly any research. So it depends on the topic, but actually it's surprising a lot of these these areas are flooded in research uh, indeed. And, and it is kind of overwhelming to try and sift through all that. It, that's one of my, one of my expertises, right? Like that's part of the training when you do a PhD is to sift through the stuff that matters and find the stuff that doesn't matter and try and be critical about the research studies to find out how good they're designed and, and try and assess it really quickly and move on. So you're not just like looking at one study for two days. You know what I mean? You can study and look at the study in five minutes and get a sense of whether it's good study, bad study, worthwhile contributing to more information that we need or not. But yeah, artificial intelligence is going to help in that. So to sort of come back to the estrogenics a little bit, um, how, because we've talked about, you know, there's ways that, that like individuals can avoid these these chemicals. But like how how difficult would it be to <laughs> to sever our, our our civilization from these chemicals? Like say say, you know, so you wake up tomorrow and, you know, decide you're gonna mail a copy of your book to uh Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin, uh Xi Jinping, um mm. like whatever the Saudis prince is called um you know all the the leaders of europe and and they all read it and they go right well okay this is this is a problem this is like a serious yep. problem and you know they make you know cop but for like estrogenics um <laughs> and then they decide right okay we need to get rid of this from our society mm -hmm. how easy or completely inconceivable is that well 
Yeah. In the personal care product world, it's actually pretty easy. You know, you can identify these classes of compounds that act like estrogen and stop allowing the companies to use them. And my, my, my philosophy is err on the safe side. If we don't have any studies, don't allow it. If you have tons of studies and it acts like estrogen or something, be super skeptical of it and the dose and all that. Just don't allow this shit in the personal care product world. That's pretty easy. Part of the problem in the personal care world is they're allowed to use the word fragrance on the label and they can hide a bunch of stuff in there and not tell you what the stuff is. So I think if there was more transparency, just simply with the label where they have to list out all the things that they're putting in there, people would figure it out pretty quick and they would, the consumer would drive the demand. But in terms of the plastics and the pipes and everything else we've got all around our, you know, just the infrastructure, I don't think you can get rid of plastics, but there are alternative plastics that cost a little tiny bit more. It's very fractional, but they, they save money and they don't use them, but they're made from like corn and stuff like this. Then they don't have estrogens. You can make alternative plastics. They're out there. They exist. Like I, I know one food company that I do consulting for, and they made plastic containers for their food that have zero artificial estrogen. And uh, it's, it's the corn plastic. It's PL, PLA. It's three letters PLA, but there's other alternatives too. There's a lot of good alternatives, so you can do it, you know? Um, and it's crazy, you know, these billion dollar companies, they literally refuse to spend one extra cent per plastic bottle. You know what I mean? Like, it's so ridiculous. It's like, sure, instead of costing two, two pounds and 50 cents or whatever you guys call it, like $2 50 cents, it'll cost $2 and 51 cents. But for some reason they refuse to do that and make it safer. And it, part of it is because, again, the scientists tell them that it's OK, you know, because this government says it's OK. And there's a lot of that going on, but also just the money saving, because, of course, if you're making billions of, of uh, Coca-Cola bottles and one cent times a billion suddenly adds up. So they they think of it on that grand scale instead of on the health motivated scale. But it's it's tricky, man. I don't know. I, the best I can do as, as an individual is just say I'm going to take responsibility for myself and I'm going to tell other people. And, and, and that's about all I can do. <laughs> well, you've inspired me at least. I'm going to, going to be having a, oh, long, having a long look at your, at your uh, product list this evening. <laughs> it should be fine. Yeah, man. But I mean, it's, <laughs> is all these other plastics you're talking about, are they, they're not petroleum based? Yeah. Uh, most of them are not. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can do it without, with petroleum chemicals. It just, yeah, I, I'm not that much of a, you know, like a, a plastics creation expert, but I've talked to a lot of people that are, and I mean, yeah, the pro part of the problem is the plastics don't look as nice. Like they're cloudier or, you know what I mean? They're not as flexible. Like you lose some of the properties that people want. So like, for example, if you have, two water bottles and one of them looks cloudy and the other one looks crystal clear. The crystal clear one is almost always, if you look on that little recycling, so you guys have the recycling symbols over there, right? Like little arrows. Yeah. If you look on that arrow, like see if you got any plastic bottles there, it'll say number one on it probably. Right. Like, do you have any plastic? I, 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 I'm proud to say that I do not. Ah, there you go. You passed the test. <laughs> so if, if it has a number one on that label, that's polyethylene terephthalate. That's phthalate plastics, right? And that looks super nice. It's all clean, clean and clear. But if you have these cloudy ones, like plastic number five, those usually don't have estrogens, but the companies won't use them just strictly because they don't look as good and people buy them less for that reason wow. too. So the consumer is driving the demand in the wrong direction. Yeah. Fucking consumer. <laughs> Customer yeah, well, is not always right. <laughs> yeah. I learned it's that. It's changed a lot, man. It's changed a lot. Like these stainless steel water bottle companies and these glass, you know, uh, Tupperware containers, all that, that stuff is blown up since I published my book. There used to be none of that stuff. Like when I published my book, man, you know, people were doing sous vide in like plastic, you know what sous vide is mm -hmm. when you like slow cook something, it's like yeah, yeah. boiling in water. They're putting like plastic bags and putting them meat in there or whatever and sous vide it. And now you can use silicone. Like there's options, you know, you don't have to do that stuff anymore. It's insane that people are doing that. So silicone doesn't have any of these chemicals in it. No, silicone's great. Okay. Yeah, silicone is amazing. I've looked into it really carefully. You can use spatulas that are silicone and mm -hmm. yeah. Um okay. 
and, and baby bottles and straws for babies, like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all that stuff, like those nipples on the baby bottles that can be all silicone. You got to be really careful with babies. Their hormones are even more sensitive, you know? Yeah. Is, is the number is like the number of these chemicals in our food and water supply and everything is this is this still going up like is this is this a problem that's like sort of like slowly been like going oh, yeah. up and then oh, like sure. a, a, like i don't know if we plateaued yet or not yeah that's, yeah, that's a good question there's always a leg there's a leg on the research by a couple of years and they don't publish this stuff until they kind of put it together. And then, of course, with COVID, everybody's using that as, as an excuse to be lazy and not pull the numbers together. So that it's hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's ex ex exacerbated the the lag time with a lot of the research. Mm. Uh, but it's been going up a lot. Yeah, I mean, in my book, talks specifically about the tonnage and how many tons of BPAs and stuff like that, and and gives actual numbers. And and it, it it's been going up in the data shows from that but i don't know if it's plateaued very like very very recently it's probably plateaued to some degree hmm. hopefully like what do you think the the the, the long-term effects of this are i write about them, man like the last chapters in my book i talk about this it alters your epigenetics that's the problem so it's not like it just causes breast cancer 20 years later it's actually worse than that because it can increase breast cancer in the next generation and the next generation after that they do animal studies with multiple generations where they only expose the mother and they see health impacts in multiple generations. That's the biggest problem with these chemicals. And I explain all that detail in my book because that's kind of nuanced. It's really tricky to understand. And of course, I simplified in the book to make it super easy, but that's like a whole other hour. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. Of discussing. But I think, honestly, that's probably the biggest problem with these chemicals because they alter epigenetics. And if you don't understand what epigenetics is, again, just jump over and read my book it makes it really obvious and easy to understand yeah yeah the the description or the the link for the book will be in the description below for for anyone that wants to get it um i certainly will be i didn't yeah man. i told myself i had too many books to read already for interviews this time <laughs> and i was like well, it's oh, got it's... the audible you can listen to the you can listen to the audio book you yeah know? i That's see I... i've not really like i've got I was doing a giveaway for Audible, for Open Audible, like the audiobook thing. So I had, I did listen to a couple of like audiobooks, and I have really enjoyed it. But I like, I find that I want to listen to like podcasts because like there's there's podcasts yeah. that I want to keep up with. And the times when I'm like, yeah. like doing stuff where I would just listen to something while I do it, I want to like you know catch up on like Rogan or Lex Friedman or um, mm -hmm. you know uh, there's a couple. Oh, of, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know the feeling, man. I have the same issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, Too much content. Give me the neural link already. <laughs> Especially when you're in the industry, like we are, you know, we're in the, we're in the podcasting realm. I'm not as much as you, but I still try and stay up on who's doing what. And podcasts are a really good res resource for that. Yeah. And no, they're great sources of information as well. And then I'm also mm -hmm. listening to them because like, I want, I want to try and learn from the people who have the biggest shows in the world, like understand what they're doing. Uh, oh yeah. 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 And it's fun. It's super fun, entertaining. Yeah, no, it really is. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a couple of whenever, especially it's like I, whenever I see uh, Tim Dillon's name on on Rogan, oh, yeah, he's I'm great. just like, this yeah. is gonna be, I, I, <laughs> it's gonna be a good couple of hours, man. I'm excited. I saw him in London as well recently. Is it? But he's, oh, cool. I think he's funnier on his podcast and on other people's podcasts than he is at uh, stand up. Just ranting. Yeah, because yeah. I prefer him. Like, just like, do you know when he's like off the cuff, just going. <laughs> Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, you have you ever heard of Kill Tony? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should watch him on. Go back and do the like the historical episodes where he's been on Kill Tony. He's oh man, I've him. never seen him on Kill Tony. That would be brilliant. Okay, dude, I will. So fun. I will he's definitely. So witty. He's so fast, right? He's so quick on his feet. Yeah. Um, he did one recently for Halloween where he dressed up like some women. That was pretty funny. But the one before that was even funnier. He's he's always funny on that show. Oh, okay, right. Well, I know what I'm doing with the rest of my evening. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, just before we finish, like, is there is there anything you want to like point people towards apart from your book, which I put uh, I'll put in the description? Like, is there anything else? No, man. I mean, I guess my website is a useful resource. A lot of people tell me they they like appreciate because it it's taken years to put it all together, all the products and stuff, and it just gives you ideas on uh, on what products you might be thinking about. Again, in the UK. And in different countries, there's going to be different brands and things, but at least it gives you some 
some ideas of categories to even that probably weren't even on people's radar sometimes that people say, oh, I wasn't even thinking about this. And, and I see the type of product he's buying there. And I can mimic that when I when I buy my next bar of soap or when I buy my sunscreen or whatever. Mm. So probably AJ, it's called ajconsultingcompany.com. It's a terrible website name. Yeah, I got it. Don't worry. Because I was sure I was, I was scrolling through the list. So I got it. Don't worry. And I'll put it in the yeah, description right. for people. Yeah. I um, made that website like 12 years ago and it was a horrible name then. And it's still horrible, but at least, at it least it's out. It's just what I have. So <laughs> ah, it looks all right, man. Clean, okay. minimalist. It's back in, like, what'd you say, nine years ago? That's like the cycle. It's back in style. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thanks, man. But I appreciate you having me on again and talking about this and raising awareness, even though it's not, you're not a health channel. I really appreciate it for uh, yeah. just to expose people that wouldn't otherwise think about this stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah it's definitely within the realm of things that people will be interested in hopefully they're listening to the show yep. or none of them are still listening in which case okay <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah man um thanks very much for your time thanks josh have a good day hey everyone thanks for making it right the way to the end of the podcast i love that you tuned in this long do me a favor hit subscribe because 80 percent of you bastards are not subscribing but you're watching my videos see you next time